for joining us today. My name is Becky Negus, she, her pronouns, and I am the founder and chief care connector for Women in Sustainability. And thank you for joining us as part of our Community Voices series today. This is an opportunity for our members to present on a topic that is around their expertise. Women in Sustainability, for those who are new to us, is an inclusive social and environmental justice nonprofit that is dedicated to caring for the people that care for the planet through community advocacy, resources, and education to create a sustainable and equitable future through the feminist viewpoint and feminist leadership. Women in Sustainability strives to create a safe space for like-minded and diverse individuals to create purposeful connections and conversations. All are welcome in our community. Well, why are we having this conversation? Uh, well, I mean, obviously artificial intelligence is everywhere these days, but for me, I've heard so many people in the sustainability space say things like, I don't wanna learn about AI, it's bad for the environment, or AI is gonna take our jobs. And basically all the negative statements that we hear in the news. However, AI is here to stay. Basically, I relate it to 1990s version of the World Wide Web. It's not going anywhere. So we need to do something. As people who care about the environment, we need to be part of this AI conversation so we can help structure it for the future. We need to understand what is happening so that we can raise awareness on the issues and the environmental impact. As we begin to see policies, we're already starting to hear, you know, like committees being formed and policies being created that are going to be introduced. How can we help frame what those will look like to protect the environment. And then on the other hand, for those of us that are working in the sustainability space, it can really support our work to help reduce burnout. It can help find ways to get our message out quicker and faster to a bigger audience. It can help us talk about ways um, to help introduce people to sustainability and help bring it to their level so that people engage in the sustainability conversation. And there's going to be so much more that we are going to learn from our panelists today. I can't wait to, to hear their stories. Um, Women in Sustainability also represents many industry, industries that represent both science and social science. And our panelists really represent that today between, uh, you know, the world of science of solar, as well as copywriting and storytelling. So kind of excited to, to combine these worlds together. One disclaimer I want to make real fast before we go ahead and get started and I introduce the panelists is that, that this is a really, really large topic. There is so much in the world of artificial intelligence to cover, and we only have 90 minutes to get through all of it. So we're not going to get down into the very nitty gritty of all of it, but my goal is to perk your interest and give you the confidence to engage in this world of artificial intelligence. As Kyle said, if you heard a little bit ago, it's constantly changing. So engaging and being involved in the conversation of what is happening. I want you to feel inspired to learn how to utilize it, how to utilize AI to support your work, engage in it, and be ready to help shape AI's future with the environment in mind. So with that, let's go ahead and welcome to our virtual stage, our panelists. First, we are going to introduce Simon Julian. Welcome, Simon. Right. Spotlight you real fast. And Thanks then we're this. and then we're gonna welcome Jane and Dakot. Hi, great to be here. Hold on, we're adding spotlights here, doing things at the time. All mm -hmm. right, and <laughs> let's welcome Omar Kahil. And Hi, everyone. finally, welcome Kyle Shannon. Everybody. Awesome. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, we're so grateful for your time. First of all, I am so appreciative that you're taking the time to talk with us today about this topic. And I'm going to go ahead and have everybody introduce themselves real fast. Um, Jane, since you're in my top right left, top left hand corner over there, I'm going to have you start with you if you want to do a quick introduction, please. Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, my name is Jane Endicott. I'm a content writer. I've uh, been writing content for online marketing, websites, social media for uh, since 2016. Uh, I met Kyle at a Creative Mornings meetup and got involved in the uh, AI salon, which I've been doing that for, for several months and just uh, spending a lot of time on ChatGPT, um, having it write things for me. 
Yay. Thank you, Jane. Simon? Hi, everyone. I'm Simon. Um, I graduated with my master's a little over a year ago from CU Boulder uh, in computational applied math. Um, I also am now the CEO and founder of Latimer Controls, where we use machine learning and other advanced models to control and dispatch solar power on the power grid. Um, definitely very excited about uh, machine learning and its advantages in sustainable energy and the integration of renewable energy specifically. Um, and really excited to hear everyone's opinions and thoughts on this call as well. Awesome, thank you, Simon, Omar. Hi everyone, my name is Omar Kahil. I am a uh, data scientist at a company here in Boulder, Colorado called Ascend Analytics. Uh, we work in the space of helping institutional investors invest in clean energy by telling them, hey, this is what makes sense to do financially uh, using large amounts of data and software. Um, I've been in the sustainability and AI space since 2018, I think. Um, and it's it keeps getting more and more exciting every year. I love that. And Kyle. Hey everybody, my name is Kyle Shannon. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Storyvine, which I realized is obnoxiously over my shoulder here. So I should have blurred <laughs> my background, but whatever. It's an ad. You can buy one today. Um, <laughs> Uh, I've been an entrepreneur for a long time. The the comment that you made, Becky, about you know it feeling like 1994. So I was a, a co-founder of one of the first digital agencies in, in 1994 called agency.com. And I, I've actually created videos on um, 2023 being the new 1995. The, the parallels are insane. Um, and uh, but but what's happening with AI is a lot more profound. It's happening a lot more quickly. Um, I'm also the uh, the founder of the AI salon that Jane's a part of and an organizer in, um, as well as, um, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I, I have a TikTok channel <laughs> at 58. Uh, oh, here we go. Perfect. <laughs> there you go. Kyle's an influencer. <laughs> yeah. He's uh, such an influencer, he set up all the alarms. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. All you have to do is mention TikTok and it, it goes on. Uh, but, but that channel is called the AI Learning Lab. And I've actually... For about the past three and a half or four months, I've been going live every night. So you, you mentioned before, 90 minutes, we don't have enough time to, to cover it. I've been going live every night um, for three hours a night for like the past three and a half months, just talking about AI, just trying to figure out what's going on. So it's it's just, it's you can go as deep as you want to go, I guess is where, where I'll leave it. Yeah, real, real time learning, right? Like that's yeah. what it's about. And Hey, you know what? TikTok isn't just for the kids anymore. Nope. <laughs> no, that's, I'm digging it. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Well, thank you all again for joining us. Um, I'm actually going to start the conversation over with uh, Simon. Uh, I want to first of all give, I don't think Leah is on this call, but want to give a shout out to Leah with CrowdSolve. Uh, she introduced me to Simon uh, probably six or seven months ago now, I think, feel like. And uh, he has been instrumental in helping to put this panel and this conversation together. So I wanted to give a shout out to that and thank you, Simon, for your help. And I wanted to start the conversation with you about how are you seeing AI currently being utilized by people in the environment and climate sectors or just in about sustainability in general? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks so much, Becky, for putting this on. Um, yeah, really, really fantastic event. Um, that's a great question. And AI in general is a huge field, right? That has truly existed for decades uh, up until now. Um, when it comes to the sustainability and climate fields, I think what has really blossomed for these fields is uh, everyone's interest in you know, making a sustainable transition. And what's followed from that is the availability of data um, and for those of you that, you know, have tried implementing some AI models yourself, a lot of these models are only as good as the data that's available. Um, and so really when it comes to the sustainable transition, I work specifically on implementing renewable energy on the power grid. Um, AI has blossomed things like forecasting weather, um, understanding when solar availability is going to be ready, uh, same with wind, uh, different dynamics on the grid. Uh, as well as monitoring 
uh, the grid stability. Um, and uh, there's other really cool applications as well, uh, a little bit less technical, such as using all this available data, uh, interesting people, behavior patterns, et cetera, to help uh, individual sustainability. So I've, uh, in my startup journey, I've met a couple of companies actually that have leveraged AI to help personal sustainability and have you, you know, take a look at your typical day and have you improve your sustainability in that fashion. Um, and then I think one of the largest, uh, you know, on a very general perspective is AI's ability to have everyone access information. So when it comes to uh, being informed for policy, as well as uh, just understanding what this transition is, um, AI is, a, you know, specifically large language models such as ChatGPT give us access to almost the entire Internet. Um, and we can really do a quick Google search or, you know, have a conversation with, you know, a, a near expert on what is really happening in sustainability, what needs to happen for us to achieve our sustainability goals um, and, you know, what we can do to be a part of it. And you actually did something before we got on this call. That's right. Yeah, I uh, I thought it'd be fun and kind of ironic to uh, ask ChatGPT uh what AI is providing for, you know, the sustainability transition. Um, and I think it, it'd be fun to prompt in a bunch of different ways, but it was really talking about leveraging AI uh, kind of similar to me as uh, using data aggregation to, you know, strategically allocate energy resources, uh, prioritize energy conversions in different industries and sectors, um, performing educational patterns, social media analysis, uh, had a really fun, uh, long explanation. So, um, you know, we're talking about access to information. But I guess I uh, tried it out right there. And then it was kind of fun because as we were talking, uh, Simon was like, I should have given it better prompts. I'm like, that's the thing with AI, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yep. it is only as smart as the prompts that we give it. Now you have everybody shaking their heads. So does anybody kind of want to jump in on that? Um, yeah, it's, it's a language model. It's a communication tool. And so language is important. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'm rewriting, I usually rewrite prompts. I always have to rewrite prompts. There's always like two or three versions and that's, uh, like any tool that you use, it's only as good as, as the person using it. Yeah, Kyle or Omar, anything to add to that? Oh, on, on the prompting, I, I prompting, prompting is very, very important right now. So the, the tools are, um, one of the things to, to, to recognize that, that Simon's right, AI and machine learning has been around for decades and decades and decades, but November 30th, 2022, the launch of ChatGPT, we sort of enter a new era. And that's where the rest of us get to play with these tools. You don't need to be uh, an engineer or a scientist or a researcher. Um, you don't need to bring your own data. It, the P in GPT stands for pre-trained. So they've already pre-trained it on all of the internet. Um, and so the tools right now are very, very raw. And because of that, we're, we're having to learn how to use, in our case, the English language essentially as a programming language. So if, you've, if you're good at crafting words like Jane is, you, you're going to have an advantage. What's going to happen as the tools evolve, though, is they're going to start prompting themselves. So we're going to very, very quickly shift from prompting being a requirement to to your intention being the most important thing. You know, what do you want? What are you trying to accomplish? And then, and then the tools will assist you in doing that. So there's some things in ChatGPT right now that do that. You can kind of watch it happen. It's pretty remarkable. I think one of the really interesting things about 2023 is this has been a huge accumulation of, uh, or we're kind of coming up to a crux point of like the, the processing power that we have in our hands and on our personal computers are unparalleled. The access to data that we have are unmatched. Um, and 
we are coming up with ways to process massive amounts of information on a daily basis that we couldn't even imagine 20 years ago. Like, you know, to, to think about the scale of the internet right now, it's, uh, you know, back in the 2000s, it would be unthinkable. Mm -hmm. um, and we're seeing that a lot more um, in the startup and the climate space. So, you know, I, I just looked this up, something like, one in four dollars that was invested in startups this year went to some AI related company. Um, <clears throat> so it's a whole new era of coming up with technologies and tools that just allow us unparalleled, you know, decision making abilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are some ways that for like all the people that are sitting on this call? like i really care about the planet and again this is really kind of you know looking at it from science and from social science right like we kind of encompass this wide topic of in women's sustainability so what are some ways what are some ways that they can be utilizing ai to think about what they're doing whether it be a science or social science field and i'll kyle I'll kind of go to you on this one and then kind of we can open conversation um I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go counterintuitive, maybe. Um, I think it almost doesn't matter. One of the things that struck me, and, and I don't mean it doesn't matter that you, don't, that you don't use them or don't try, it doesn't matter where you start. And it really doesn't even matter if where you start out is specifically about sustainability. Any sort of play, like I've, I've been, what's, what's been hitting me lately is, is, a concept I'm calling lateral play, where I've got my job and I've got what, what I do and what I know and what I think about. And then these AI tools are kind of, you know, some of them are in that lane. And then there's there's a bunch of stuff that's outside of that lane. And, and it's like lateral play. Like I go over and I'm playing with AI and I'm like, oh, this is fun. This is cute. And then I go back to work and all of a sudden I'm faced with a problem where I'm like, oh, wait, that thing I just played with, that actually solves that problem. So I think one thing to do is ju just get curious and start exploring that it literally doesn't matter where you start or what you do. It could be create a recipe book, create a fall gardening plan, mm -hmm. create a project plan for your family to for the weekend trip to wherever. Like it literally doesn't matter because in playing, what you'll start to discover is the boundaries of what's good and what's not, what these tools do well, what they do poorly, where they lie, where they, where they tell the truth. One of my nicknames for ChatGPT is mansplaining as a service. <laughs> it will confidently answer you, even if it's wrong. Uh, <laughs> like all the good men in your life. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but, but, Learning that and understanding that and experiencing that in 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 sort of any activity um, will will start to inform you about oh I, now I know that's possible and then you'll go back to work and and you'll have a grant you know proposal to write or something like like that and all mm -hmm. of a sudden you'll go oh I can I can try this here and then you'll try it and you'll have what 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 I lovingly call your Kevin McAllister moment which is this moment where you're like. <laughs> I didn't know it could do that. And then once you have that, then it's kind of like you've taken the red pill and you can't go back. Yeah, yeah. I would kind of piggyback on what Kyle said. Like, like the next time you find yourself Googling something, before you put it into Google, ask chat GPT or, you know, whatever. What just just like ask it. And it is gonna mansplain, like it's gonna, it's gonna have some misinformation. It's only trained up to like 2021. So it gets some things wrong, but just, just so you like see what it does and you experience it. And that's when you start to learn, that's when you start to learn that kind of prompt crafting that we were talking about earlier. Uh, you start to, to realize like, oh, I, I, I need to clarify something or I need to play with it a little bit. Um, and not necessarily so much doing that to like solve your problem, but just to see what it does, but also to see like how quickly it does it. Like, I, I, when I, one of the first times I started using ChatGPT for one of my writing jobs, I was writing a website copy for uh, like a small tech company. And so I was looking up a lot of technical terms, uh, trying to figure out how to explain it in a way that, that people outside of the industry could understand. 
And I, I roughly, I would say it saved me about two hours of time on that project. Instead, you know, it would have taken me, if I had gone to Google to research those terms, it would have taken me maybe one to two hours roughly to get those answers. And I got them like in five seconds, you know, and, um, and that, that is, that is, your, that is what will stun you. <laughs> it's not so much like, the result it's when you see how quick like how more efficient your tasks become and then like kyle said you start to figure like oh i have to write a grant proposal or i have to write a cover letter a resume like let's just see like what ChatGPT says and it's it's really like it it just accelerates human process the processing it's um so that that'd be where i would start a huge caveat I would add to that is the, you know, trust but verify. Like we as humans are very uh, error prone and we all have our biases in some way. And being that something like chat GPT is trained on the entirety of the internet or the entirety of the text yeah. that humans have generated in the past few years means that it is very likely to have those biases that we as humans internalize. It is very likely to make those same mistakes that we make. Um, so just always be cautious of those things because they aren't like intentional errors on the model's part. It's just baked into the data that it feeds off of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point as you be become using these large language models like BARD or ChatGPT, uh, to understand at least fundamentally what they are and how they're made. Um, and they are trained on data through algorithms that are honestly very similar to like teaching a three-year-old how to ride a bike um, and, you know, or teaching a, a kindergartner in the classroom. A lot of these models aren't aware that they're lying to you. Um, and when you do understand a little bit more of how they're trained, uh, it does, you know, kind of separate this distrust um from the you know the output that's coming from them um because really what it is is they're just getting the answer wrong they were trained on this data they learned you know they went through maybe you know 12 years of of coursework in however many seconds when they were training and now they're giving you their best response um so these hallucinations that they have uh especially when you're prompting them you have to be aware of whether or not what you're prompting these these models is something that can have a correct answer. Um, I th I was guilty of this right when ChatGPT came out. I was starting to ask it to like, you know, invent different things or you know, give me code that can do this, you know, solve this math problem that's almost unsolved already. Um, and that's not something, at least right now, that it's able to do because you know that's not what it's trained to do. Um, so you know, you have to you have to be wary when you're prompting these models that you're you're being you know what you want to get out of ChatGPT and you want to prompt it in a way uh, that it's thinking in the right way, as well as uh, prepared to give you information that you could find theoretically on Google or after going to school for maybe a couple of years, et cetera. And that's the power in it is you can accelerate those processes, um, but you know it still has to be within the realm of reality and what it is trained on, because it is really only a mathematical model at the end of the day. If if I could jump in on the on the hallucinations part, it's a really it's a really important thing to understand. Hallucinations is just basically it's lying to you. It's it's not even lying to you. That implies that it's conscious of what it's doing. It's not. Right. It it confidently presents you something that it says, here's your thing, and it may or may not be right. That's not necessarily a bad thing, right? If you're trying to find factual information, you don't want it to hallucinate. But if you're writing catchy headlines for something, the fact that mm -hmm. it's making stuff up is okay. So depending on the use case, you know, you, you, again, know, know your boundaries, right? Know what it's good at, what it's not. In some use cases, that might be absolutely fine. You don't need to worry about it. Other ones, you need to trust and verify mm -hmm. everything. There's another thing about how you prompt the way these large language models work that is very different than a Google search. Google over the past 20 years has essentially taught us to put the minimal amount of words in the search possible, and they'll figure out the rest. If you overcook a Google search, it just turns into a mess, right? These large language models are almost the opposite. Um, if you say to it, you know, tell me about this particular kind of math problem, you know, like Simon mentioned, 
it will look at kind of all of the internet and, and in all of the internet are where the Stanford professor talked about that math problem and all of the students of that professor and anyone who just had an opinion on that math problem. And so what it's gonna bring, bring back is some amalgamation of all of the math problems, right? And so you might get stuff that's really weird. But if you give it more context, if you say, hey, I want you to act as a Stanford professor in mathematics in this particular area, and I'm really interested in this particular area of mathematics, and I don't know much about it, but I heard about this one problem. It, basically, if you, if you add layers of context around what you're talking about, it narrows that world of data so that it's only looking into that sort of bucket, the semantic region in probability space that, that has a, a higher likelihood of having the right answer in it. So, and, and, and again, I'll go back to the play thing. The only way you start to discover these boundaries is just throw a lot of stuff at it, throw a lot of stuff and just start to see where it lies, where it doesn't, where you can man manipulate that where you can't. Yeah, thank you. And kind of along those lines, thinking about, you know, the data is only good as the input and what it's getting from, you know, the World Wide Web. How can we help to reframe some of those things? If like where it comes back and it's like climate science is not real, it's a lie. You know, we know that that's not true. How can we, as people who are utilizing these AI systems, help to kind of reframe the output that it's giving us? Is that possible, even? Well, I, I well, I think it's I think it's absolutely possible because so you're not going to necessarily reframe the algorithms, right? You're not going to retrain the math. Now, you might within the within a given conversation within ChatGPT, you might be able to get it you know, closer to what you're looking for. But why I say you can absolutely manipulate it is we as humans ultimately get to, to decide what of what ChatGPT gave us we're going to use, right? And mm -hmm. you can also say to ChatGPT, hey, I don't like that. That's not true. That's misinformation. And it will go, oh, I'm sorry. And it, it'll it'll give you a different answer. It is programmed to try to please you, to try to give you what you want. So if you start walking it down a path of saying that climate change is misinformation, it will happily walk down that path with you. And then if you say, no, no, I want to go this other direction, it will go that direction. It's ultimately up to us as editors, curators of what these machines give us to choose. OK, what's the stuff I'm going to put in the world? Part of the fantasy of these tools is a lot of times I hear the robots wrote this, the robots did that. It's not really how it works. It's a human being saying, give me something. And if that human being doesn't edit that and just puts that false thing out in the world, that's the human being's fault, not the, not the large language model's fault. So, so don't give up your critical thinking, you know, just because these machines seem so capable. They're, they're, just, they're just tools. And they're, as Simon said, they're just probability engines. Yeah, I know. Jane, you got something to say. Omar, I saw you come off mute. Uh, no, I was just agreeing with um, what Kyle said about critical thinking. I mean, the last kind of couple of questions we've talked about as far as, you know, not trusting, not trusting it, but also, um, you know, uh, I can't remember what somebody said, trusting it, but also like fact checking it, you know, like we're not, um, critical thinking skills are more important than ever. Like you can't just completely just submit <laughs> our, our thinking to these machines like we, we we actually have to be asked more questions and harder questions um that like that i don't know that's just it's it's more important than ever yeah and i know Omar, you had something to add yeah i was just going to briefly mention that <clears throat> the thing that makes chat gpt special compared to all these other like largest language models is that it uses something called um RLHF, which is reinforcement learning with human feedback. So it takes all of these like pieces of information and based off of the human feedback that is given to it, based off of like, you know, the thousands upon thousands of queries that people give it and how they think if it did well or if it didn't do well on those, that's how it like essentially learns to get better. So we have the ability to, you know, to make chat GPT and these tools become better uh, by contributing to those, uh, to those systems. But I also think that's just gonna be a, a huge turning point because 
you know, reinforcement learning is a fairly new field in the last couple of years, and it's only going to grow uh, in all these applications. But now that we've learned how to use it and how to use it well, I think we're going to be able to see a lot cooler applications for it. Yeah, and I definitely think they're, they're all saying it is the critical thinking piece, right? Like you know, Simon and I were talking a little bit about that before we started. We were just hanging out, and that was really important to think about. You know, we the, the it's only as good as we as the people inputting that data, and so you hear so much about these negative effects, like you know, AI is going to be taking our jobs and AI is this, but really, we can't take the humans out of the AI because we've helped to kind of create that AI, at least at this point in time in present space. Um, so I'll kind of, I'll, Simon, I'll go to you on this one too, is like, talk a little bit about, you know, what are some of the positive parts of the artificial intelligence technology and, you know, what we, how we can positively be using that in a space of climate, environment, and sustainability? Yeah. Um... I'll start by zooming out a little bit uh, outside of like chat GPT and these large language models um, and give maybe an example of, you know, the space that I'm in with the power grid. The power grid is something that was developed by Thomas Edison uh, many, many years ago. And it's something that it, it's, I think it is the largest machine that exists right now um, in terms of it's not something that's gone through repetitive innovation in any way, shape, or form until we've kind of hit this huge acceleration of wanting to completely transform it for sustainability reasons in terms of integrating renewable energy and such. Um, and that's left a non-trivial non -trivial acceleration gap of the technology that we need to implement into the power grid. Um, and so different elements of AI, uh, such as, you know, machine learning, different uh, forecasting, modeling tools, um, data aggregation, all, all that entire umbrella is really what's driving forward us to transition very quickly um, and understand exactly, you know, piece by piece how we can transform this power grid uh, from something that was, you know, made centuries ago to something that we want to happen, you know, in the next 30 years uh, of hitting these sustainability goals. Um, and I think in general, that is the huge power within AI. Uh, that was obviously just an example. But um, from my personal experience, I've learned so many more topics uh, that I've just ran into day to day, you know, starting my company, um, I'll be, you know, working on some implementation, realize, oh, I know nothing about uh, communications, or I know nothing about um, you know, writing LinkedIn posts and, uh, you know, making people engaged and interested and in trying to convince them of a certain topic. And I can go from zero to one in those topics very quickly, uh, just by having access to basically a teacher uh, that can accelerate your growth. Um, and my opinion, I know it comes up a lot about, you know, like AI taking jobs, um, or, you know, ChatGPT taking jobs or, you know, different models like that. And uh, my opinion and what I've seen so far is that it's not necessarily taking jobs, it is accelerating the amount of work that you can do in your job. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, as a data scientist, uh, of course, ChatGPT can do the simple data science, but you still need a, you, it still needs a supervisor and it still will need a supervisor uh, for a long time. And all that means is as a data scientist, an assignment that would have taken me a couple of days uh, to produce a model for and produce finalized results, I can do in you know 30 minutes, check it over, and then go on to the next. And now all of a sudden, my overall business is just pounding out more and more valuable material. Um, and it's not a lack of job opportunity; it's just an increase of speed. Yeah, yeah, I I really agree with what you just said, Simon. As far as like like. As far as, um, you know, the positive, AI really has the potential to, ex to um, like enhance human potential. So that accelerating of the work, you save that time. So kind of stepping out of like sustainability for a moment, thinking about healthcare, like I'm sure everyone here knows somebody or has known somebody who's had a chronic health condition or 
um, has one or hasn't has a hard time getting diagnosed for something, maybe they spent years on a medication that didn't work well for them. Like imagine, um, you know, a model that's trained on not patient information. I'm not saying that I'm just saying like symptoms or health information or like all of the research that's been done in the last two decades. And then a doctor can go in and like type in some symptoms and maybe instead of like, you know, maybe they rule out like, oh, this medication won't work for them. And then you've just spent, it saved yourself maybe two, five, 10 years of time. Like your health is better. You're more productive. You're contributing to the economy. You're living your life. Like just, just that, <laughs> you know, something that would have taken that doctor an entire career to become an expert on, they can just like use a tool to like look up and, and research this information. And of course that you know, again, you still need the human aspect. You still need to back up the information. The doctor still needs to like make sure it's valid, but it just accelerates the amount of time that it takes for them to, you know, find out what's wrong with the patient and find a proper health treatment plan. Like that's, that's quality of life. And, you know, when you can spend one hour doing something instead of 10 hours doing something, you're now just, that's, that, that's nine hours that you can spend with your family, riding a bike, learning a language, going to school. Like that's, I mean, that's just unleashing a huge amount of human potential. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll take, I'll, I'll kind of expand on what Jane's talking about here. I guess build on what Simon said and on what Jane said. <clears throat> um, one of the most profound things that I've experienced. So, so one of the things I hear a lot from people who haven't played with ChatGPT is, oh, if it's if it's doing all this creative work and it's doing all the writing for you and it's making all the pictures for you, aren't you less creative? And I found the exact opposite to be true. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because what happens is this. So I, I have ADHD. And so when I'm into something, I'm into something. And when I'm not, it's, you know, it's it's literally like a, a stainless steel trapdoor trying to get anything happening. And what happens with AI now is, well, before when I had an idea, if I had an idea and I'm like, oh, this is an interesting idea, I'd go to Google and I'd be like, okay, I want to learn about this idea. And it would send me to 40 different sites. And then I would get lost down these rabbit holes. And then I'd go, oh, here's a piece of software that does that. And I'd go download that software and I'd install it and it would break my machine and then this. And then I realized I had to put in my credit card. Like 45 minutes later, I still haven't started the thing. I don't even remember what the idea was, right? What happens with generative AI is I have a whisper of an idea. I'm like, oh, that's kind of interesting. And, and, and I almost dismiss it. Like it would be work to have to, you know, research that. And then I go, oh, let me just run over to ChatGPT for a second. And you put in a whisper of an idea and boom, out comes some, some realized version of that idea. And you're like, oh, that's actually better than I thought. And then, well, what about this? Boom, there's another idea. What about this? There's another idea. So I'm finding myself like overflowing in both in terms of productivity, but also idea generation, like writer's block is, is ceasing to exist yeah. in my life. And that's Jane. I mean, you're a writer. Yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely. A remarkable thing. It, that, that human humanity amplifier aspect yeah. is it's, it generates, I use it a lot for, Oh, I'm sorry. I just interrupted interrupted you Kyle a man sorry no, I'm oh, yeah. uh, bad joke <laughs> um yeah like it it I use it a lot for idea ideation uh I just finished writing for the salon a why statement and I I I wanted um we we have this language I, I was really focused on this language around Dungeons and Dragons where like we are this group of misfits we all have our specialty and we're bringing our specialty together to go on on like this quest to understand like on this frontier and and I I use chat GPT like I I kind of ran some uh brainstorming ideas that we did as a group and ran it through chat GPT and I said put it in the language of Dungeons and Dragons and it gave me like vocabulary that I could have come up with on my own, but it would have taken me much longer. And, and I was like, oh, that's a good word. There's a good word. And I'm cutting and pasting and we're kind of, you know, passing it back and forth and workshopping. But it, it again, it, it just, it generated that idea. Like I had this idea in my head of like what I wanted it to look like. And by, by asking, you know, the chat GPT, like, hey, I want it to sound like this. It, it just, 
it, it, it got the juices flowing, you know, it kind of oiled the gears, so to speak. Yeah, for sure. And Omar, kind of on that side of like the creativity side, how does that relate to you and the data? Um, I, th I think it's interesting because to me with, uh, with AI solving problems, I sometimes do end up like use ch using ChatGPT as like a starting point for some of my work. But I think when I think of AI as a tool in sustainability, I end up thinking a lot more of like the actual like scientific uh, applications with, you know, the large amounts of data that we end up processing uh, through machine learning for, you know, earth science or, you know, all the stuff that we do for remote sensing. Um, you know, like one of the companies that I had interned at while I was in college, it's called Perennial. It's based here in Boulder. And what they do is they use satellite imagery to be able to measure the amount of like carbon in soil um, and they use that to be able to issue carbon credits so that, you know, they're giving out actual carbon credits that are valuable and worth something and actually good for the environment. And they take that money and they give that back to farmers to support regenerative agriculture. So it's like really interesting because, you know, I think 10 years ago, we wouldn't have had the tools or the AI systems or the AI technology that would have allowed us to do, you know, to solve all these massive problems, whether on the power grid, whether in the agriculture space or in transportation. So I think when it comes to sustainability, there's also that aspect of like, there's a lot, a lot of hard science problems that it helps us not just outright solve, but estimate to a close enough degree that it is essentially a practical solution for us. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. And again, going back and using your human intuition, right? It all comes yep. back to that critical thinking piece of here's the data. And I myself have also found myself in that boat of like, oh my gosh, I like I can't think of what to say or what to write or what to do. Mm -hmm. And I will, sometimes I'll test it. I'll Google it first and I mm -hmm. can find myself going down a Google rabbit hole for hours and hours and not getting in <laughs> anywhere that I want to be. And literally I was spent five, five hours. I'm like, yeah. what did I just do with my time? <laughs> and then I'll go put it into chat GPT and I'm like, oh, Literally, that took me 10 minutes. Cool. Yeah. Um, right. So time saver is special. Don't, hey, just don't tell your bosses that you know how to do that. Um, <laughs> but um, I do want to kind of, uh, you know, there is a little bit of an elephant in the room as we are a women's organization. We do only have one woman <laughs> on our call. Um, but I want to take a second because I know when I was looking for speakers for this conversation today, it is actually hard to find women who are experts in the artificial intelligence space. And I know Simon and I, Simon, Jane, and I kind of were talking about that a little bit before the call started as well. But um, Jane, kind of want to throw this over to you a little yeah. bit about yeah. kind of as a woman in the space and how do we get more women to engage in art? artificial intelligence. Space. Sure. Um, yeah, that was, I thought really hard about that question. So my, my mother was raised in a, in a culture that expected her to be a housewife. Uh, and she is anything but a housewife. Um, and so she, like, she's lived her life doing exactly what she wanted to do, like climb mountains. She's traveled all over the world. Uh, she pursued higher education when nobody expected her to when nobody showed her how to or or when nobody showed her that process um she she did all of these things without asking permission without any role models without empowerment and um i've kind of like subconsciously like followed her example i'm like oh okay i can just do whatever i want and i think you know i think younger generations of women have kind of um maybe lost their nerve like I hate to say it but you know they're they're used to having somebody show them the way they're used to having looking for that female CEO or that woman in the space who can say like hey it's okay you can you belong here and you know I, I think women just have to stop waiting for someone to give them permission and just do it I mean I this isn't this isn't a male or female issue this is a human issue this is something that impacts everybody regardless of you know your background your culture your experience your ethnicity your sex gender whatever it will impact you and you know if you don't get involved in it you're going to get left behind um 
and you know, especially with women, like it's an economic issue. Like what got me into it was, like I said, I, I met Kyle at a creative mornings meetup and this was in January. So this is like a month after chat GPT. And I was, and he told me he was working with AI. I was like, so I'm a copywriter. Do I need to find a different job? <laughs> <laughs> Am I out of work? And that's what it was for me, you know? And he was like, you should have been working on this yesterday. Like that's how, and that's how urgent it is. It, for me, it was, I'm going to lose my, I am going to lose my job. It is doing my job. Like the writers guild of America, like they just ended a strike, like, because they're, they're fighting, you know, these tools that are, that are potentially putting their jobs at risk. Like this is an existential issue and it's, it's, it's impacting writers now, but like it'll impact sustainability soon or impact text. Like, you know, it's, it's going to hit every industry. So, you know, especially for women, like it's an economic issue, it's your career, it's your, it's your professional development, it's your opportunities. Um, and it's, it's just more urgent than ever that you, you can't wait, just don't ask, just do it. <laughs> like nobody cares, <laughs> nobody cares and it doesn't matter. And, you know, it's scary for everyone. So don't wait for permission to do it. I think that's sound advice for women in just about anything that we do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I know Simon kind of, you uh, before we started, we were talking about that a little bit, kind of Jane hit into it as well, just the diversity and fact of getting more diverse voices into artificial intelligence field. Yeah. And that's, that's definitely something that I've been passionate about um, both, you know, from a gender perspective, as well as uh, my, getting minorities into this field. Um, and AI is an interesting kind of transition, especially with ChatGPT, where some really technical fields are now being presented to the, the general public and getting people excited um, with it, you know, to be an expert in AI probably means that you're an expert on the technical side, um, unless, you know, you've spent the past couple months really digging into ChatGPT itself, which plenty of people have as well. Um, but for me, I think a huge factor, as Jane also alluded to, is um, just the having a mentor and someone that you look up to, whether or not there's someone that you actually know personally or kind of an idol in these areas is really important. Um, and I think uh, my dad also was uh, one of these people that was kind of just a freak. And, you know, his, his mom went to fifth grade, his dad went to eighth grade, they lived in the Caribbean and just moved to London. And then all of a sudden, my dad, you know, got a PhD from Cambridge. Um, and, you know, he didn't grow up with money, obviously, or anything like that. He just did. He was just one of those people. Um, but when we talk about, you know, getting, you know, the masses of minorities and the masses of women in sustainability in these technical areas, um, or, you know, any industry that is disproportionately represented, I think it's a really strong tool that we can use is highlighting the idols of people that have done it. So people, you know, like our parents, um, one that I like to use a lot for my startup, my startup is called Latimer Controls. And at the beginning of almost every single one of our pitches, we tell the story of Lewis Latimer. Um, Thomas Edison was the original inventor of the light bulb, but his invention uh, used a bamboo filament that would burn out almost instantaneously. It was really just an invention that stayed in the lab. Um, you know, it was a cool way to illuminate the lab for maybe a minute. <laughs> um, but it wasn't until Lewis Latimer developed the carbon filament that transformed the light bulb from this lab kind of cool invention to a product that we saw in our everyday lives and lit up the entire world. Um, so highlighting, you know, representatives like Lewis Latimer, or whoever it is in these fields, and showing them as someone that people can look up to and, you know, realize that these things are really cool and, you know, idolize it as they're growing up and choosing their interests, I think is really important, you know, as we talk about getting the masses and more and more people into these areas. Yeah, that's huge. I'll, I'll share a thing. It's it's not necessarily a male female thing either. Um, and and there, was, there was a similar thing that happened in the early days of the web. I can't I can't overstate the the November 30th 2022 you know is sort of the flag in the ground for me for a new era that machine learning and AI up to this point had been hyper technical right stem right and what ChatGPT does is opens up this profoundly powerful technology to to the humanity side steam the the art side the humanity side mm -hmm. that the language side and 
like it, it, that's deeply profound to me, right? Because yeah. I, I think one of the fears of AI and machine learning is we've only seen it in, in science fiction films. We've only heard sort of geeky scientists talk about it. And, and, and I think there's this preconceived notion that you have to be a polymath to be able to use it. No, you just need to know words. I like my nickname for this era is revenge of the liberal arts major because because yeah exactly because <laughs> just using your basic critical thinking skills and horizontal yeah. thinking you now have all these specialty skills that you didn't know you had um you know uh, you know powered by by these tools made available through yeah. the language you already speak and so that that to me is there, there's an on ramp there that is so much broader than i think people realize Yeah, I I love that kind of idea of it moves away from science into social science, right? Because I think that that is, and maybe that's part of the issue that I'm hearing from people because they're so afraid of it is because it's a science thing. Right. And now chat GPT and all these other tools that are out there now open it up to creators like yourself and Jane, as well as the, you know, investors Simon, who's creating and data and, you know, it opens it up to everybody and almost mm -hmm. starts to even out that playing field a little bit more between science and social science, the arts and the, the sciences. And I, I, I love that, you know, I think maybe that's why I've been so engaged with this because I'm so immersed in those two worlds with women's sustainability. And I see how it can be beneficial in those both spaces, again, using it myself every day um, and how I can make it make my life easier and better mm -hmm. um so kind of along those lines and what people that are sitting here are going okay this all sounds really cool but I'm still kind of afraid and Kyle I know you kind of said at the beginning of like just go play with it but what are some steps that people can take to maybe start to familiarize themselves with the tools and I know everyone kind of has said chat GPT is there something else that they can begin to to use or is chat GPT the best, right? Like there's so much out, out there. I think that's another confusion. There's it's, it's so, many. so many. There's so many. So many. <laughs> oh my God. The, the yeah. answer is if you're just starting, start with chat GPT. It's it it's it's the one that invented it. It's the best. They're rolling out a bunch of stuff right now. There's all sorts of stuff coming. Um, again, once you sort of cross the threshold of dipping your toe in the water and you sort of have that moment, then, then you can start exploring it. But I, I would say start with that. And, and where I would start is with what I call parlor tricks. Have it write you a country song about your dog or your significant other. Have it write you a poem in the style of Shakespeare. Like have just just say, um, write me a project plan for, for dinner this week, this weekend. Like it, it only it, it literally doesn't matter. Just just throw stuff at it. And, and what Jane said earlier, like what, what will blow you away initially is how quickly it does it. And then what starts to happen is then you start to go, oh, well, it, okay, you can do that. That's cute, right? That's the parlor trick. That's cute. But it definitely can't do what I do. And then you ask it to do something that you do and it does it and it does it really fast. And sometimes it does it really good. And then you go, oh, and like my epiphany with it was I, I was sitting, this was sometime shortly after it came out in December of, of 2022, I was sitting on the couch. My wife was watching some crappy TV show, so I wasn't paying attention. And I'm just messing around with ChatGPT. And I said, oh, write me some Python code because I heard I should learn Python and I heard it could do code. And it wrote this Python code. And I was like, oh, I, I realized I don't know how to run Python code. And I said, I don't know how to run Python code. And then it said, oh, you open up the terminal program and you type in this command line. I was like, no, 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 no. I don't want to do command line crap. Like, isn't there a website I could just run Python code? It said, sure, here's five. And the first one was replit, which is a good thing. And I copied and pasted it. Within 90 minutes, I had coded a functional Python application that took five inputs and outputted five pieces of social media content. It, it blew my mind. And that was like, I was absentmindedly playing with this tool. And within 90 minutes, I had done something that probably would have taken me three months if I had the attention span to do it, to, to like learn enough stuff to, to get where I got. Yeah. And so, and so 
again, the entry point is is almost irrelevant. Start with ChatGPT mm -hmm. and just start playing, and it will yeah. lead. I would I would add also to that is uh, finding your weirdos like it's yeah. it, you know one of the things and I'm I'm gonna kind of shamelessly promote the salon here now is that we're you know we've realized like you're not gonna learn in a silo like it's if if you're just doing it by yourself you know fine that's great but when you when you talk to somebody you say, Hey, I played around with this, um, you know, and this is what I'm tr struggling with. And then they're like, Oh, I also did it. And here's what I learned. Like I've listened to writers in our salon meetups kind of share some of their tools and insights. And for them, it was just like, Oh, I just, just wrote this prompt. And for me, it was like mind exploding, you know, and, and when you're, when you're interacting and engaging with other people, you're learning from them. And you're also like, realize you're realizing that you're stronger you know more than you think you do and it kind of like the fear comes down a little bit you're like oh, okay this isn't so bad you know um so i i highly encourage people like whatever way you can like find your weirdos you know like find that person who's also like we say excited and terrified <laughs> which like like it's both it's both like awe inspiring. I use the word awe because awe is like, oh, wow, that's, it's like something bigger than you, but it, it's also something that can destroy you, you know, at the same time. <laughs> uh, so finding somebody like anybody, no matter who they are, that shares that feeling and, and like buddy up, you know? Yeah. Simon or Omar, Omar, some tips. I was going to say more on the technical side, um, Andrew NG, he's a, he's one of the big professors at Stanford who uh, has been in the AI space for many, many years. Uh, back in 2011 or 2012, he launched a course called Intro to AI on Coursera. Uh, it quickly became like one of the most popular AI classes to have ever been taken online. And it is it, it is a basic uh, for anyone who's going into like machine learning or anything. They re-released a similar course recently called AI for Everyone uh, on Coursera. I'll send the link in the chat in a little bit. Um, and it basically covers three or four subjects. Uh, what is AI? Uh, how do we build AI projects? How do we incorporate this into our daily work? And then AI and its impacts on society. Um, and I think for folks who just have a, like, not a very rigorous academic background, just, you know, want to look at the 101, what is AI and a little bit of the math behind it and why all this stuff works and maybe even like dip their toes a little bit more, I would highly recommend this as a way to get started. Yeah, please share that course with us. We'll share that out in a follow-up email as well. So, um, that is great. Simon, any suggestions on? Uh, Kyle, I really liked your idea of just uh, throwing in, asking you to write your poem and such. Uh, that's how I started. Yeah. Um, and then I kind of got uh, defensive, as you said, and started throwing in like my hardest math problems that I could uh, try and get to <laughs> That's awesome. To tackle. Um, it's not and... going to outsmart me. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I'm still important. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'd say that's a great way to start for a chat GPT, at least some of the other machine learning models, definitely some of the coursework uh, or uh, just reading up on, um, you know, the available literature, whether it's a paper, or just a magazine post and such, uh, just machine learning models of, overall are taking over yeah. um, it, with a lot of help and sustainability in a lot of other fields, uh, but those obviously are heavily, you know, computer science -y and uh, math based but very interesting if you if you have the the interest in it yeah and it, it depends how geeky you want to get like if if you're like you know i've always kind of wanted to get a little more technical like go hang out on reddit and see what people are talking about with particular kinds of projects and then almost all of the development right now the 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 code that people are working on they're sharing it they're putting on github as as things you can go play with they're putting on hugging face that you can go play with and if you're like yeah but i don't know the technical stuff like that python thing i did in 90 minutes you the this the distance between you being completely clueless and and being able to like do something decently technical 
used to be two weeks or two years, depending on where you were. Now it, it's like two days or two hours, right? Like you can get up to speed so much more quickly. So if you have a penchant to, to geek out a little bit, you know, I would say just start to explore, just get curious about it and start to explore. And then what you might find is, oh, there's specialized models for sustainability, or you'll dig deeper into within ChatGPT, there's a thing called advanced data analysis. It used to be called code interpreter, but you can upload data. So you could go to a site like Kaggle and get environmental data, go into advanced data analysis, and you literally just with English English words like that an, that an ex actor could use, which is what I am, you could say, look in this CSV file and tell me what's interesting about the data. Oh, what are any trends that you see? Are there any anomalies with this thing or that thing? And it will do the analysis of that data. So without being super technical, you can start to move into places that, that right now probably feel very far away from you and, and actually are not. Yeah, I love that. Things are at our fingertips more now than ever, right? That's we yep. can get the information that we need. It's just utilizing it. Um, we're going to open it up to some questions. We got a question a while back. I'm going to go back to a um, question from Abby that asks, are there any organizations, and this is in regarding the conversation around hallucination. So Simon and Kyle, um, are there any organizations with repositories for pressure testing instances that we might run into? I don't know what you mean by pressure testing. Abby, if you're still here, if you want to. I am, yeah. Um, pressure testing as in we're having a conversation with BARD or chat GPT. Um, and we run into, I mean, this happens a lot. Like a journalist at the New York Times is pressure testing as in trying to make the um LLM kind of come to life or yeah I know what you're talking about. in yeah. all of these instances but you know we're not New York Times journalists so where can we report harmful you know if we're doing it for a good cause in terms of like I want to see how far I can get with climate skepticism Oh. Um, are there any organizations that we can say, hey, I had this conversation. This is a really harmful thing that is happening. Um, I want to submit screenshots or whatever. You can give feedback within chat GPT. So there's a thumbs down button. So if it gives you something that's out of bounds, you can do that. For the most part, the there's with with the commercial large language models, ChatGPT, BARD, Bing especially, Bing's I, I think has gone too far with this. Almost all of them have safety guardrails built into them. Um, Bing is so bad. I, I I told Bing it made a crappy image a couple of nights ago and it got offended and shut down the conversation. So um, so some of the safety guardrails go too far. Um, but but there there are feedback mechanisms within them, and they take those seriously. As Omar said, the the human reinforcement learning thing is is a huge part of how they're fine tuning these these models to to get them better. Um, I would also say talk about things that you come up with in public, right? Um, because ra raise awareness that way. Um, I had another thought, but I lost it, so I'll let I'll let other folks talk on it. Yeah, I am not i would be willing to bet that there are definitely uh feeds on reddit or some other locations that do definitely keep track of this type of thing um but kind of as kyle said there's the thumbs down button but also uh these large language models are designed to learn from you know your responses so in to some capacity you can tell it you know here's information which i do all the time i argue with chat gpt all the time um, so if it were to give me some, as the example we've been using is some anti-climate change uh, response, you know, maybe then I would go to Google, find an article uh, from, you know, the National Renewable Energy Lab or some trustworthy source, throw it to it and be like, uh, you know, here's information that you seem to be missing. Um, and that is feedback that it can reflect on. Um, so in, in a lot of senses, you it's something you can tell it directly. Uh, but if you're if you're concerned about uh, kind of more public facing 
um, you know, posting about its limitations or, you know, some dangerous or uh, inappropriate response in some regard. I'm sure there are plenty of feeds out there and um, maybe should be more. I haven't found any yet, but I haven't really been looking that closely. I, I remember what I was going to say. Um, there's also, so Meta released the Llama 2 models, which are their large language models to, to open source for commercial use. If you want to, you can install an unsafety restricted large language model that's about as powerful as GPT 3.5. So Llama 2 is incredibly powerful. You can just install that thing. I know a guy that installed it on his company's <laughs> um, Slack channel. And um, they said it's absolutely wild. It goes off the rails. It swears a lot. It'll You can get it to do all sorts of stuff. So if you actually, because you mentioned the word pressure testing, if you want to pressure test what is possible with an unrestricted large language model, they're actually just sitting out there for you to experiment with. And, and what what could be an interesting thing to do is say, okay, if if the anti you know climate change people were to use this tool, what is possible with yeah. it? That would probably be a good thing to learn. Like go push the edges of it, go play with an un, unrestricted model and see what's possible. You don't have to put any of that out in the world. But I, I the sense that I got from this guy in installing that on their Slack channel, he goes, it's jaw dropping, like how mm -hmm. insane it gets. It just loses its mind. It cusses it just starts speaking different languages so so you, you want to you want to taste the dark side it's it's out there for you yeah and and if the tool isn't out there and i've been reading some of the questions too that are that are here like there's something in here about ethics which i'd be interested in hearing anyway sorry but if like if if you don't if there's something like hey if you're like hey there's nobody talking about this there's nobody talking about pressure testing mlms for climate change like be the person who does that that's yeah. maybe that's how you get into it is you say all right i'm going to see what happens when i'm like the earth is flat and let's let's see how chat gpt responds to that or let's see how claude responds to that and then you go on, you know, whatever your social media is and you say, hey, I'm a client scientist and this this concerns me. That's like be that person. There's there's it's it is a wilderness right now. Like you, like if you want to know if if there is an expert in anything or if there's someone out there doing it or if there's a voice, the answer is there's nobody. And and you have the power to be that person. So, uh, you know, if you're not finding it, like be be that voice yeah i think that that's so important beth and i kind of were joking the other day we were in the conversation about something and we we're like we should go on to to truth social and figure out what they're talking about like <laughs> yeah. right like i mean but it's sometimes good to know what the other conversation is yeah. how to frame the conversation it really is it is yeah i, I know yeah. kyle and i've talked about this and simon and i were having this conversation like it's it's not that people on necessarily the other political and political sides of the party differ. Like I think there is common ground that we all care about the environment. We speak about it in very different ways. And yep. it's learning how to come together and learn each other's language mm -hmm. so that we can have Absolutely. a conversation in each other's language about what we're trying to achieve and to solve for the future. So I think that that is really important. Um, and we do have a bunch of questions coming in. So I kind of want to get through as many of these as we can before we have to wrap up in the last like 10 to 12 minutes, but, um, and, and kind of going along with this as well, um, you know, kind of what, what we are saying is maybe this data doesn't exist, but so for somebody who may want to dig a little bit deeper, what evidence is, is there evidence I would ask available that shows the impact of AI on sustainability? And maybe that doesn't exist yet, right? Like that's what we're saying. I don't know if there's data that exists directly um, on this. Someone out there is probably trying to aggregate something like that, but it seems to be very, it would probably be very difficult to do, at least in my opinion. But I, at least from my experience and from what I've seen uh, within the sustainability world is AI has drastically improved our abilities to come up with solutions and, you know, at least technical solutions to drive change positively in the sustainability sustainability world, whether it's with climate modeling, whether it's with optimization problems, whether it's with decarbonization technologies, there's all kinds of like AI tooling and, you know, impact that we have there. 
On the other hand, I will say there is a huge, huge problem that comes with it of the training of these massive models. Uh, you know, these are these are models. When I was looking at it, uh, some Stanford source said that the training uh, for Chat GPT for GPT three specifically uh, produced five hundred and two tons of CO two emissions. Uh, when it was being trained this year. And, you know, comparatively, the average car in its lifetime uh, produces about 63, 000, uh, 63 tons of CO2. So that's about a 10x difference. Um, so, you know, there's companies like Google that are working on programs like, you know, their 24-7 clean energy initiatives and all that. But it's still it's going to have to be a very big thing where we look at, hey, you know, we need to do this cost benefit analysis correctly uh, with the environment. Um, yeah, and building on top of that, I mean, it, with the phrase AI and sustainability, there's a whole lot of evidence. I mean, just the problems that, you know, we work on every day, for example, um, you know, there's been multiple islands and multiple locations throughout the world that have hit 100% sustainable power grids and held that number for multiple days at a time. And this is due to artificial intelligence operating their battery storage and controls on their grid. Um, that's a super specific example, but, um, it, you know, in terms of just using artificial intelligence, using uh, advanced mathematical models to improve things. Uh, yeah, the evidence for that, you know, exists in a lot of places. That's almost too broad um, of a question to answer. When it comes to ChatGPT, I uh, haven't found uh, real evidence on um, how it's impacting a lot of these industrial places yet, at least um, not a lot of evidence that's, you know, concrete and published or anything like that yet, but I'm definitely excited to uh, see it when it does come out or if anyone had recommendations i'd love to read it yeah i want to know something too i think it's interesting is that you know and i think somebody said chat a little bit in the chat earlier but like ai should be like sustainability the way we perceive it within women's sustainability is it applies to all industries it applies to all of our works like we don't need a sustainability field we need everybody doing sustainability mm -hmm. in the work that they're doing and thinking about climate and environment and the work that they're doing and I'm going to kind of call Jane out a little bit of this because I know when we talked a little bit the first time and we yeah. had a conversation, like you kind of talked a little bit about it in our conversation, but then I went and was like, like going through your stuff and I was like, wait, wait, she's all in this sustainability, but did ever call it sustainability, yeah. right? And I was just like, yo, yeah, like there's a ton of stuff that it's out, you're posted on that like relates to climate and sustainability. Oh, I, oh, <laughs> but see, okay. that's it, right? Like it is how... It is, I think the people who generally care in general just, just comes out natural. The people who are doing this, it's a natural inclination to care about the environment and how we're framing and what we're doing around the world of intelligence. And it's it doesn't necessarily need to be called in a field or an industry. It should just be incorporated into everything that we're doing. Yes. Uh Tell me more about that. <laughs> later, we'll chat later. <laughs> okay, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm a what? I'm an expert? No. It's just a lot of suppose. Like, uh, hey. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we need, like, we need every perspective on this. Um, you know, I, like, one of the, when I was kind of preparing for this panel, like, as, as someone who, like, works in social media, like, we've seen the dumpster fire of social media for the past 20 or so years. I mean, it's had some really positive effects. It's it's made us more connected, but it's also spread a lot of misinformation. And it's easy for people to say, like, that's a tech thing. Like, that's not my, that's that's not my area of expertise. That's a tech thing. I don't understand how it works. And in, in choosing... In, in accepting ignorance, like it, then now you're not participating in how the world creates, how the world uses that. Um, and, you know, AI, I, I think technology, not just AI, but technology in the very broadest sense of the term is as important as learning how to drive and knowing where babies come from. Like, it's just something that you should understand and you and it, it isn't it's incredibly uncomfortable i'm a creative like i make pretty things but i i realize that like technology understanding how technology works helps me do my job better understanding how 
how to write an AI prompt helps me do my job better. And, you know, it's just, we're, it, it's learning, learning how to drive a car. You just got to know how these things work. You just like, you don't have to design anything. You don't have to like know Python, but just even just knowing how it works. Like we all, we all have to be some level of understanding and efficiency at this. And if, if we want to create the world that, that we live in. Yep. And it, I, I think that's right. And, you know, this has nothing, I know the question was about what evidence do, do we have that it's working? You know, ChatGPT is nine or 10 months old, right? This is, this is a very new tool. For me, the fact that it democratizes specialization, meaning someone who doesn't have deep expertise, you know, outside of, of whatever they studied, what that says to me is there's going to be a, an exponential series of inputs of ideas from people who are not part of, you know, the, the given scientific community. They're going to use these tools and they're going to go, well, I wonder if I could do this with this particular sustainability thing. And, and they'll come up with some tangential idea that a scientist might not have, and that will contribute to the science. So I think we're going to see an increase in scientific breakthroughs, not necessarily just from scientists. It's going to be coming from lots of different places because so many more people have so much more ac access to expertise. So that, you know, that's maybe an optimistic view of, of what's coming and what's possible. Yeah, I love that. Um, so we have cut, kind of a couple questions on ethics and um, Beth did a great job working to combine them together to try to make it a little bit easier for us. But um, so there's one that's specifically around chat GBT and cover letters. Um, <laughs> cover letters. <laughs> <laughs> um, always edit your own stuff before you put it out there. Yep. Um, critical thinking, right. Going back to that, I think yep. is important, but, um, so this person, this person specifically talks about how she's heard some HR services screen for cover letters created by chat, chat GPT and disqualifies them. Are there places that we should not be using chat GPT for moral or ethical reasons? And then kind of tied into that as the next one um, is noting people who are concerned about sustainability also prioritize ethics. It's important to note that not all gen AI tools are the same. Are there any thoughts on the concept of voting with our attention and dollars to encourage development of tools that are consciously built with ethical practices in mind? Yeah, um, I have thoughts on both of those questions, actually. I don't know quite where to start. I mean, as far as the HR one, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is, is that HR professionals use AI to, um, you know, screen cover letters and resumes, or they use programs to look for certain, like, keywords. So why wouldn't a job applicant, job seeker use the same tools to get a leg up you know like i don't think there's anything wrong with that um i mean obviously don't just copy and paste you know and that's where the critical thinking skill comes in but you know like job seeking is just as hard as job finding you know as far as far as finding a good applicant and so i i don't see anything wrong with a job applicant um you know using that to get an advantage if that helps them you know, and then as far as the ethics, I think it just, um, you know, kind of goes back to like, the more the, the more that I understand technology, the, the more I'm able to um, detect, <laughs> not detect, but the more cynical I get, the more I'm like, oh, come on, you know, I think someone said, there's a comment in here about hijacking the reward system. It's like, um, you know, you talk about like going the rabbit hole in Google. Well, Google is really good about making you go down the rabbit hole. Like social media is really good about pushing the button back here <laughs> that triggers that dopamine. Like it, you know, these, the technology has gotten good about keeping you on the technology. And so it takes a certain amount of discipline, critical thinking to, to break away from that. The more you understand the tools, the better you are at um, you know, I don't know, just detecting the bullshit. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, you know, and that's, and that's more like a good reason to not, don't stick your head in the sand. Like, like, you know, when, when you really make the effort to even just, just follow 
like what's going on with when the CEOs go to the White House to talk to Biden and, and talk about policy, like, what are they talking about? You know, like, it, to really ask those questions, like the more involved you get, the more you ask those questions, um, I, you know, the better, the more that you can then sh shape the, the, that, that we will, you know, that our culture will use these ethically, whatever ethically is a very subjective, but, but I get what the person is saying. I think. I'll just, just super quickly. Yeah. I know we're short yeah, on yeah. time. Yep. I think um, GPT checkers are going to be a thing of the past very quickly. November 1st, chat GPT is being rolled into all of the office 365. It's going to be ubiquitous in all the tools we use. I think those things are ridiculous. So um, that's that. In terms of companies, I, I, I would say just like, like all of, you know, sustainability thinking, pay attention to, to what companies are doing. Adobe trained their image models um, on no copywritten images. It's on um, public domain images and uh, things that they own the rights to. They're gonna allow artists to opt in and opt out of being trained on. Um, Anthropic uh, is the company behind Claude. They're, they use a thing called a constitutional learning model, which as opposed to humans um, validating this stuff, which might inject bias, they're using a constitution where the model trains against the constitution. That can be very transparent. So they're a really interesting company to, to follow. Um, and I, I would say, you know, just start to get curious about this industry and pay attention to what the companies are doing. Listen to Sam Altman, you know, talk about, you know, the dangers of this stuff. He's, he's a CEO that's acutely aware of the implications of this stuff. You know, whether or not he behaves right over time, will be seen, but he's he's at least conscious of it, right? Some of the other CEOs are not. So I'd say just like everything else, just pay attention to what's actually happening. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Great tips from both um, Omar and Simon. Anything real fast you want to add into the ethics conversation before we do a quick wrap-up question and I end? Uh, I just have a really quick comment. I think the cover letter is a really good and interesting example. Same with resumes of, you know, all these companies are were already using programs that they wrote or somebody wrote to find keywords and throw out resumes. Yeah, All exactly. ChatGPT has done is add the next iteration of that to where it's not just identifying these keywords, it's interpreting the content and then throwing it out. Um, and so this isn't like a replacement thing that might be you know unethical relative to what they were doing. It's really just, you know, they're both programs that mathematically you know find a word and throw it out chat gpt is just better at it um or you know any of these large language models so that's a really good example of kind of um it it's you know not necessarily a negative thing in a, in a poor light and a lot of times it's not even a new thing at all it's just mm -hmm. you know, half an iteration further and it's a tool that can be used for good absolutely that's that's a really good way to put it a really good way to put it omar anything real fast to add to that no, you guys covered. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, I'm going to have one more question before we go, but I do want to thank everybody for being here because um, I know that we are past our time and I know that it has been a 90 minute. So I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who has jumped on and joined this conversation today. I hope that you're feeling a little more confident, a little more inspired to just go and test it out. I'll play around, continue the learning. We will be sending out a follow-up email that will have the resources from the chat It'll have the information for um, all of our panelists. Feel free to you know keep in touch, keep the conversation going, continue to learn, because when we continue to get better, we'll help the machine get better. Um, so continue to do that. As a thank you to our panelists, on behalf of Women in Sustainability, we'll also be saying, be planting five trees in your name through our partnership with One Tree Planted. You Great. will actually receive a certificate <laughs> with your name and where trees were planted. Um, we do plant them in North America to help with forest fire, forest fire recovery, since we have had a lot of forest fires in the last several years. Um, so thank you from all of us so much for your time and sharing your expertise. Um, I said one more question, but I wanna give everybody, give you a chance to give you a round of applause. So thank you. And as we kind of wrap out of here, our, we always have one final question for our, our speakers and it is, um, looking into your crystal ball, kind of what do you see as the future? So thinking about AI and how that plays into sustainability and Omar, I'm going to kick this this question to you first of what do you see in this world of AI and sustainability? Um, 
this might be slightly opposing to what someone would be expecting me to say, but I think not worrying as much about the, you know, AI aspect of it and, you know, the, that I, I understand that everyone has their concerns with it, but I think AI is going to play a part in sustainability, but I think there's a lot more that's happening in the sustainability space that doesn't have to do with AI um, that I think we should all be looking forward to. Um, AI can help make those areas better, but, you know, it's not the... It's not the big scary beast that we're all scared of. It's really just a tool and we make of it, you know, what we can. Mm, I love that. Kyle, what are your thoughts? Um, for me, the, the thing that has, has most surprised me about um, working with AI and, and the way ChatGPT inter interacts with you is it's reminding me to be a better person because it's it's always positive and it's always there. And it's like, sure, I'll give you another draft. It's just, there's something about it that kind of reminds me to re-engage. I have, I have a sneaking suspicion that these tools may reintroduce us to our humanity. I think we've lost it. I think social media has isolated us. I think, you know, the, the sort of divisive politics over the past years have, have you know, further divided us. And I have a sneaking suspicion that the way these tools interact are going to remind us to reconnect and give us the time because they save time from the drudgery of life. We're going to find time to be able to reconnect. So I have a sneaking su suspicion we're going to become better people 10, okay. 20 years out. I, I love that thought. That is such a great inspirational thought. Uh, Jane, what do you think? What do you see for the future of, of sustainability and AI? Um, I, um, kind of, yeah, just kind of what Kyle said, um, just, I, I think it is going to make us, it's an opportunity to make us more human. And, um, yeah, I, I just, I, I'm just excited about being able to kind of pioneer it and, and create the, create the world that I want to live in. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential for that. Uh, I, I just think the fact that everyone being here today, taking the effort to like learn about it, um, you know, is, is like you're taking control, you're taking agency of that future and you're going to have a hand in it versus, um, you know, somebody making that future for you. So that's what I'm really excited about. I am here for that. And last but not least, Simon, um, thank you again for all your help with this. What do you see for the future of sustainability and AI? Yeah, my biggest excitement for AI is just access to information. Kyle alluded to it earlier, but allowing someone to become a relative expert, learn about something when not being an expert beforehand is a huge, powerful skill and is something that definitely the field of sustainability needs. Um, you know, it's probably the most stuck in its tracks. You know, everyone has done everything the same way for the entirety of its duration until just now. Now everyone needs to learn something different. That's going to be a huge uh, opportunity for AI to help make that transition. Um, looking into the future, I think it is similar to like the dawn of the Internet or Google. Um, I, I always joke with my friends, you know, being relatively fresh out of college. I have no idea how anyone got any sort of math or computer science degree before the internet, like <laughs> really went to the library and just read books on and figured it out. And that must have taken so long versus, you know, we can scroll through Google, see similar coding scripts or see similar mathematics uh, operations. And then we, you know, we learn just, it seems to me that it'd be quicker. And I think that this is a similar transition. It's hard to know exactly what it's going to look like. And of course, you know, Google opened up the opportunity for, you know, cheating in, in my generation, but then, you know, assignments began to change from, you know, you're not allowed to use Google to here's a really hard problem. Please use Google because that's, you know, what's done in common industry practice um, and, you know, figure out this really tough problem with the help of the internet. So I think um, that we're going to see a similar transition where, we're going to be less afraid of AI once it becomes more normalized and it's going to become a tool that helps us make these transitions um, and just kind of alters our perspective on what problems we can and can't solve. So, 
Yeah, I love that. Perfect way to end. I'm going to note I added a link in there. My partner and I are watching the show called Rewind the 90s. And it makes so much sense of why mm-hmm. things exist in the modern world that they live in. I highly recommend go back and watch it. And uh, you'll start to be like, oh, cool. that's how we got to where we are today. So um, thank you again to all four of you for your time, for sharing your expertise. Um, Please, everybody, have a wonderful day. Enjoy your afternoon. It's gorgeous if you're in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And we'll see you soon. Womeninsustainability.org. We've got more events coming up later this year. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, Becky. Thank you. Thank you.